everything will go to work. We used to take, uh, take all the banners down. These I can still do once I get up on the ladder. Made, I made two of
Well, good morning and welcome to St. John United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Just a few announcements before we begin this morning. First, again, if you are on Facebook Live and watching, try to um, comment for us so that we know that you're there and who it is that's joining us together this, this morning. And we also still have the 2021 flower chart up in the narthex, and it will remain there. So anytime you might be in the sanctuary um, or in the building, you can sign up or you can contact Dory in the church office. Vacation. I'm going to be on vacation next week, uh, beginning on Monday through the following Sunday. But I will be on call for uh, emergencies. So I'm just doing a staycation because that's the safest thing to do. Uh, we're going to be welcoming back Philip Bala as he fills the pulpit next Sunday. And for flowers, the centerpiece on the communion table is in memory of Penny Celestino, and the vases are in honor of Judy Butler's grandchildren's November birthdays. So I invite you to join into a spirit of worship as Carolyn begins playing for us. invite you to join together with me in the centering in our, of our hearts in worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. We worship the Lord with gladness. We come into his presence with joy. Nor know that the Lord is God and it is God that made us. We are God's people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We give thanks to God and bless God's name. Let us worship the Lord our God. 
I invite you to join together with me in calling upon God. God who reigns over heaven and earth, may we know your presence among us. Gathered and sent, may we celebrate your reign in our worship here and our service wherever the week ahead takes us. God, forgive us when we forget that our worship is not confined to a particular space or place but that you call us to serve you in all things, not least in creating community and caring for each other. As we serve and are served, may we see your face before us in each person we encounter, those in need and those we need. Amen. And now a message for the young and the young at heart. Well, if you look at the, at the screen, there are photos of a lot of different companies and, and products. And most of the time when we see a logo, we know the product that they represent. But each company typically has something called a mission statement. And a mission statement is usually a one-sentence statement that summarizes what the company is about or how it affects people's lives. For example, I'm going to give you a couple of mission statements for some of the companies that are shown here. And... I'm going to see if you can guess the company. The first one, the, the logo isn't actually on here, but their mission statement is to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. I'm going to give you a hint. Their symbol is a bluebird. That's Twitter. Twitter. There's another one, to be one of the world's leading producers and providers of entertainment and information, using its portfolio of brands to differentiate its conduct, content, services, and consumer products. I'll give you another hint. They've recently launched their own streaming channel. They have two theme parks in the United States where Mickey Mouse lives. It's the Walt Disney Company. And just one more, to refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happiness, to create value and make a difference. This company is known mainly for their drinks. It's the Coca-Cola company. Well, sometimes the mission of an organization is not very clear when you look at their logo. And for most churches... The cross is the logo for the United Church of Christ. The cross and orb, as you can see up on the, on the wall here or on the upper right corner of the screen. Now, what do you think the mission statement is of the church? Is it to save people? Is it to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the imprisoned? Or is it something else? Well, I'm not really going to give you the answer now, but I want you to listen to the Bible reading from the Gospel of Matthew that you're going to hear a little while later in this service because I think it tells us what the mission of the church really is. So let's pray. Holy and living God, we are so grateful for the life of Jesus Christ whose reign we celebrate today. And we pray that we can see the world and see one another with your eyes. That we can see your divine presence in each other and know that we are one community through you, through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, there's been a slight change from what's in your bulletin because I forgot to update the the video that we typically show, and I had left in the video from last week. So what we're actually going to be seeing today is the choir from First Plymouth Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, and they will be singing Crown Him with Many Crowns in honor of the reign of Christ, which is celebrated today.
And now is the time in our worship where we lift any special joys or concerns in our lives or the lives of those we love and care for. If there are anyone who's watching on Facebook Live, if there's any particular prayers that we could lift this morning, you can comment on those and Eric will relay those to me. I have a couple prayers. One is for Jerry and Marilyn Mollat, who uh, have recently been tested positive for COVID, as have a number of residents of Glen Park in the main house. So for Jerry and Marilyn and all those who are residing in Glen Park, including the staff, Lord, in your mercy. Also for the Donahue and Celestino family, some of whom have gathered with us this morning, in honor of the memory of Penny Celestino, Lord, in your mercy. And for the Vandermark and Schaefer family who celebrated the life of Monty Vandermark last Thursday here at St. John, Lord, in your mercy. For the Schock family, uh, Ronnie died recently and Thelma is waiting results of tests, Lord, in your mercy. And for all those affected by the hurricanes that are impacting Central America where um, dozens of people have died and have been left, thousands have been left homeless, Lord, in your mercy. Well, let us gather together all these prayers that we have heard, confident that God, God knows and hears our deepest joys and our greatest concerns, whether we can bring them to our lips or not. So let us spend a few moments in silence lifting these to God. Lord, we see you kneeling at our feet, showing us how to serve and be served. Lord, we see you touching the unclean, showing us how to heal and be healed. Lord, we see you hanging out with outcasts, showing us how to be in community. So may we follow your example, seeing the need in our world and being first in line to step up and make a difference. May we also recognize our own limitations and make room for those who are differently abled and differently gifted, knowing that in the economy of your kingdom, no gift is wasted, no talent rejected. Lord, when we despair at the state of our world, may our despair compel us to join you in the work of peace and justice for all beginning wherever we are, following your lead. Lord, may we know your healing in our lives, in the life of our community, in the life of the world. May we live so conscious of your presence in all that we cannot, in all that we cannot turn back or withhold your love from another, but no fulfillment only when we have given all to serve you by serving our neighbor. So God, one radical act of kindness at a time. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven as we pray in the way that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Well, we continue to do the work of the church in this time of the pandemic and hope that at this time, 
If you're at home, you will prepare an envelope to send in your gift or connect with our tithely account as shown online. If I, if I remember to change the slide. <laughs> as shown on, online here. So in, in gratitude for the immeasurable gift of Jesus Christ, let us bring our tithes and our offerings to God. I invite you to join with me in the dedication of these gifts. Lord, make us willing to share what we have, for without you we have nothing, and help us to see the wealth of others as they share their gifts with us. And so together may we work to build your kingdom now. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, open the eyes of our hearts by the power of your Spirit that we may know the hope to which we have been called in Jesus Christ. Amen. The first reading for this morning is taken from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16 and 20 through 24. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on the rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, 
and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at, at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they will no longer be ravaged. I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, one servant, David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And the second reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. And again from the New Revised Standard Version. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as, shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Holy Spirit breathes into us these words. Well, in a workshop I, I attended a few years ago, pastor and writer Carol Howard Merritt was, was talking about how people have been wounded by religion and how some of the things we do tur turn people away from the church. And in a small group discussion during the workshop, one of the other clergy at my table said that um, she felt that what often happens is that we let our religion get in the way of our being compassionate and in the way of our showing grace. And all too often, I think that is true. We in the church get caught up in doing what we've always done and then get upset when new people want to show their love of God and neighbor in a different way. Sometimes we judge others for believing or behaving in a way that's different than us. And we fret over such things rather than living a compassionate life and seeing God in what is new to us, seeing God in one another. Well, as Philip Gully points out, there is a reason Jesus said the most important commandment is to love. To love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. In our gospel passage for today, we hear the climax of six parables and warnings about living responsibly so as to be ready for the coming of the Son of Man, the apocalyptic story in Matthew that I talked about last week. And by the time of the writing of the Gospels, Jesus' followers had begun to realize that, well, his second coming might not be as soon as they had anticipated. Now, the emphasis we find in Matthew is to always be ready, to be active in the world, 
living an eternal life every day. Because being ready is living with compassion and having eyes that see. I really think Matthew was trying to get the followers of Jesus to, to focus on living as Christ in the world, living with Christ by embodying Jesus' message in the way that they lived. Matthew was trying to inspire people not to lose hope in the face of mounting persecution and to not get caught up in orthodoxy over orthopraxy. Matthew was telling them and is telling us to live love so we will always be ready to see the unity of creation, to see God, to see God and Jesus in one another because seeing is believing. Now, in most of the interactions between Jesus and the people the scriptures call the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leadership in that time and place, we often find Jesus berating them for judging others for how they followed or didn't follow religious norms for being concerned about outward appearances rather than relationships, for being religious without being compassionate. And in Matthew 23, Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples gathered around him, Do whatever the religious leaders teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they don't practice what they teach. In fact, the entire chapter of Matthew 23 is a diatribe against such people, with Jesus saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, over and over again, and even calling them hypocrites. And he chastised them about giving the appearance of being holy by following their interpretation of Scripture without living the love of God, of following religious rituals without connecting them to how those rituals enable the love of God and neighbor, for forgetting the connection between their faith and the compassion of God. And how often do we fall into that same trap? I have to say, and you might disagree with me, that some who hold the Bible to be the infallible word of God and want to interpret the Bible's message in a literal sense often let their religion get in the way of compassion. Many, but certainly not all, seem to be overly focused on following the rules of the Bible as they understand them through the lens of their own cultural bias without understanding the difference in context of today with the time and place of the original writings, without relating the stories and the teachings to loving God and neighbor. I get concerned when so many argue so loudly about abortion and the sanctity of life also actively support things like capital punishment, separating children of asylum seekers from their parents, all while fighting against any form of universal health care, wearing masks, or even meaningful gun control. I get concerned when people become so angry about legally allowing people who love each other to marry regardless of their gender identity. I get concerned when those same people ignore what greed does to the hungry, the naked, the sick, and the immigrants. I get concerned when people proclaim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior without showing how the words that have touched their lips have claimed and changed their lives. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's Matthew seven twenty one. For as David Mosner writes, salvation does not belong automatically to those who have faith, but rather to those who do faith. And I believe this story in Matthew emphasizes that point. Martin Luther himself said, where there are no good works, there is no faith. He said, if works and love do not blossom forth, it is not genuine faith. The gospel has not gained a foothold, and Christ is not yet rightly known. This is the same man who claimed that we are saved only by faith and not by works. And remember that he taught that works are not required to earn salvation, since salvation is something we have already been freely given through Jesus Christ. Yet he believed 
that our faith is shown in the good works that we do. Our salvation is lived out when we live the love we have been given. Seeing the love of God and acting on it is believing. I know sometimes it's just so much easier just to have a list of do's and don'ts, a list of rules to follow to be Christian than it is to do the work of living like Christ. Following Jesus, living and seeing like Jesus requires looking beyond ourselves, beyond our own wants and needs and desires, and beyond our egos. I don't think we necessarily need to seek God out in that process, however, for as we heard in the passage from Ezekiel, I myself will seek out my sheep and will seek them out. God seeks us out. God reaches out to us. We don't earn God's love by achieving certain goals or thinking that we can be redeemed by following certain rules or saying prayers in the right way. God loves us. God loves all of us. And God wants us to know and understand God's love. God wants us to do nothing more than live in response to our salvation. God wants us to love one another as God loves us. To love as God loves. To see as God sees. And Matthew points us in this same direction. In our story from Matthew, from which Jesus described the final judgment, both parties, the, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left, were surprised when the king addressed them. Both asked, well, when was it that we saw you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, in prison? See, neither group was specifically seeking God. Yet those who fed the hungry, those who gave a drink to the thirsty, those who welcomed a stranger and clothed them, those who took care of the sick and the imprisoned, those who responded to the poor, well, they were surprised because they didn't look for God. They didn't look for Jesus in doing what they did. They simply lived love. They simply let compassion rule their lives. They lived their faith. Seeing God in others, seeing God in creation, is seeing Jesus. And seeing is believing. Now, as with many Bible stories, there are many levels of meaning and many points of interpretation, even among biblical scholars. Now, some interpret this passage as a judgment of the Gentiles or the non-believers, those who did not believe in or know the one true God. Other scholars look at this passage and identify the sheep as true believers and the goats as those who only go through the motions without believing, those who do things by rote. Well, maybe they're both right. So let me ask you, how many, how many of us would like to identify with the sheep, those on the right, or would like to think that we would at least end up on the sheep side of things regardless of which scholar we feel is right? Now, thinking of that, did you notice that the judgment was not based upon what people believed or said they believed, but on how they lived? They are judged not on whether they verbally expressed their faith, on the words they used to pray, on their orthodoxy, but on how they treated other people, how they lived the love of God, their orthopraxy. They were judged on what God saw them doing, because seeing is believing. I've heard others argue that this passage is about judging how non-believers specifically treat treated believers or disciples. And in the New Revised Standard version of this scripture, which we heard today, the righteous, the sheep, asked the king when it was that they helped the king. And the text says, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. The least of these who are members of my family, members of the king's family, members of God's family. Now, these people who argue this interpret this to mean only those who have proclaimed Jesus as Lord and Savior. I know, right? I think that's a stretch. 
But here's the logic such people use. In Matthew 5, Jesus told the disciples his family, and we've talked in the past about how Jesus redefined family as something beyond simply blood relations, as it was commonly felt in his time. Jesus said, as you, go, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You have received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts. No bag for your money, no tunics or sandals or a staff. For laborers deserve their food. And this passage suggests that the disciples were to be totally dependent upon the hospitality of the people to whom they were bringing the good news. That the disciples were to behave as the least, as immigrants, as asylum seekers. These people see this story in Matthew as non-believers being judged on how they treated specifically believers. I struggle with that, but maybe they're right as well. I, I don't really know. But I have a tendency to believe in the radical hospitality of God, to believe that God is looking for compassion as a response to salvation, as a response to God's seeking, as a response to us being found by God, as a response to us seeing God in one another, even if we don't realize it, even if we have not proclaimed ourselves as followers of Christ. I believe God sees us all. The word of God from Ezekiel, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. I will rescue them from the places to which they have been scattered on dark clouds and thick darkness. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. And then as Psalm 100 tells us, know that the Lord is God. It is God that made us and we are God's. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. We belong to God, and God seeks us out, all of us. To love, to have compassion, is to see one another as God's creation, to see as God sees, and love God with our entire being by loving our neighbor as ourselves. Because seeing is believing. Well, as we move into this holiday season, a holiday season that because of the pandemic will likely be unlike any we have ever experienced before, I want you to remember God's words and remember how Jesus described the final day. It may be that we won't be able to gather with family this Thanksgiving or to gather as a congregation to enjoy what we usually enjoy, the beauty of our English Nine Lessons and Carols closing with Silent Night on Christmas Eve together in one place physically. We may not be able to shop and exchange presents with our families and friends, but there will still, there will still be hungry, thirsty, sick, imprisoned, and desperate people longing for compassion even more so this year than others. May you see God in them and believe. May you act out of compassion and love, not because you are looking for God, but because you know you have been found. May you see the divine within and see the divine without believe. Amen. I invite you to join with me in praying together in the time of a pandemic. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who don't believe in the virus respect and protect those who do. May we who have no risk factors remember those who are vulnerable. 
May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have family to care for our children when we return to work remember those who can't because they have no one to care for their children. May we who have to cancel our vacations remember those who lost their jobs in the tourism industry. May we who are worried about our investments remember those who live paycheck to paycheck. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the living embrace of God to our neighbors so everyone can live and breathe. Amen. And now I invite you to respond in music. For those of you who are at home, feel free to sing at the top of your lungs, but I ask that any who may be in the sanctuary to sing softly so as to limit any spread we might have. So let us join together and rejoice, give thanks, and sing, and we'll be singing two verses. Let us commit ourselves to being Christ in the world. As we step into Advent and once more prepare to welcome the infant Jesus, go purposefully, loved by God, guided by Jesus, and inspired by the Spirit. Our worship has ended. Now our service begins.